one, a two, a one. It's time for the Better Horses Radio Show. So let's saddle up and ride as we explore the Western way of life, horses and cows, family and friends, a relationship with the land and a relationship with God. It's all here on Better Horses Radio. Now let's hit the trails with the Better Horses team. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us here at Better Horses. We're coming to you from the heart of the Midwest, Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm excited to be here because I get to quarterback this week's lineup of guests. But I got to tell you, I have a new wingman who's also my co-host, professional horse trainer, Matt Joe. Matt, thank you for joining us. Howdy, y'all. Thanks for having me. You know, you got a big job here because we have a real good lineup. And not only do we have a good lineup, but Matt, we got a lot of different disciplines here. Yeah, that's the best part of this show is very well-rounded and you get to hear from all angles and and uh, it's really good stuff. You know, we're going to start it off with professional dressage trainer and instructor from Crown One Farms located in Pleasant Hill, Missouri, Alexis Losey. And she's coming to us after she just got done winning her silver medal at the pre-St. George level. And then, Matt, we're going to take it a whole different swing over to Montana. Yes, sir. Coming from Rygate, Montana, we have uh, Kurt Pate, stockmanship. Now, Kurt stock, starts a lot of horses, does a lot of stockmanship demos, and uh, travels the country. And, and how he handles cattle is pretty amazing. You know, I know you got to ride with him at Equifest, but, you know, He's conducted a lot of stockmanship demonstrations and he truly is somebody to go see. And I know that you and I have done this together, but it is truly a talent out there. Absolutely. Yes. There's an art and a skill to it. And, and he's very good at relaying that. You know, and with that in mind, we're going to take a quick break talking about stockmanship and talking about cattle. We're going to throw it over there to our Better Cattle segment with Mark Oppold. Mark, it's all yours. Well, thanks, Ed. Hope everybody had a great 4th of July holiday. Kind of nice to have that holiday on a Thursday. So Friday, yeah, it was a work day, but a lot of folks did make it a four-day weekend. We take a look and getting things back in action here, moving through this week, that cattle trade doesn't have a lot to go on here through this week. Uh, Cash appears to have stagnated here of late, and we don't have any uh, 4th of July beef demand numbers as yet, as uh, as of uh, our report right now. Regardless, though, with the box beef hovering over $330 and beef production down 1.6% year over year, cattle prices near the top, we think. One has to consider how much longer this can last, putting expensive feeder cattle into feedlots here right now. Speaking of feeder cattle, nearly a dollar swing. This was early week. There was nearly a dollar swing three or four times in a in a half an hour time frame here in the feeder cattle complex early week most involved in the cattle market believed to be waiting and see what what cattle feeder cattle sell for or maybe better said what someone is willing to pay for those through video auctions like the one going on this week superior livestock a week in the rockies underway here of course in uh, snowbird utah a lot of folks are watching those sales here as well Futures trader is making it even tougher on cattle feeders. Fats are lower, feeders are higher here, and that's been going on for some time, putting, again, these high-priced feeders into the feedlot. And, you know, and uh, many people looking at this grain trade, wow, uh, what a way to start this week. Corn sharply lower, but a lot of folks saying that feed costs are not believed to be able to trade low enough to offset the price of these feeder cattle, and it looks like, a lot of folks will be filling, willing to continue to pay up for these feeders right through summer and into fall. That's how we see it at this time. Thanks to be uh, great to be part of your program once again here, and hope everybody has a profitable week ahead. And I got to tell you, Matt, Mark is doing a great job bringing us all these better cattle segments. And I think he's just unbelievable as far as everything going into horses and going into equine and then getting into the cattle segment. So I know you have a cow-calf operation, so you can appreciate this. Absolutely. You know, a lot of horse folks do have cattle, whether it be through their FFA kids or 4-H kids. And uh, and if they don't have cattle, they usually wish they did or at least can go play with their horses on cattle. 
you know, you are a professional horse trainer and I appreciate you being my co-host and we've got a minute. So I want to let everybody know you've done a really good job building a partnership between horse and human. Give us just a quick little tip of what it's like just to get everything from mounted shooting to cold starting, things of that sort. It's a whole new game now. Would you agree? I agree. Um, and it all has to do with just having that willing partner. And so a lot of times we have to change us before we can change our horse. And then once we do change us, bring our horse with us and uh, work with them. It's We're a team. We don't work against them. We get them in that willing frame of mind and we can go conquer anything. You know, I absolutely love that. So I want everyone to stay with us. We're going to listen to Come Right Back with professional dressage trainer, Alexis Losi And Matt, if you don't mind, I want you to stay with us. We're going to use you as our next segment, our final segment of the show, and you can walk us through all of your training techniques. too. Sounds like a plan. All right. So everyone stay with us with more Better Horses Radio. I'm Ed Adams. And I'm Matt Job. And we'll be right back right after these words from our sponsors. This is the Agricultural Law and Tax Report. I'm Roger McOwen. A trust can be a useful and maybe even an essential part of an estate plan, but it's important to avoid the common mistakes associated with trusts. I'll be back in a moment with the details. Buying and selling farm, construction, and fleet equipment has never been easier than it is with Purple Wave Auction, a global marketplace free of reserves and hidden fees. It's the place to go to buy or sell heavy equipment. Get started today, purplewave.com. Truck accidents are on the rise. David Rabine at RBR3.com comes from rural America and has dedicated his life to helping families recover from personal injury accidents. Other lawyers refer their clients. Learn more. RBR3.com. When it comes to trusts and estate planning, certain common mistakes should be avoided. One mistake is the failure to fund the trust. That means transferring assets into the trustee's name. Doing this will put the assets under the trustee's management and make the assets subject to the trust terms. A trust without assets is a worthless document. Another mistake is to put your homestead in the trust. A homestead has numerous benefits that can be lost when put into a trust unless it's a special type of trust. Watch state law on this one. Also, don't put a vacation home in a trust. If you do it, make sure to put enough money in the trust so that the beneficiaries can maintain the home. Better yet, put it in a family limited partnership or an LLC. It might be a good idea to check with your heirs to see if they even want to have to deal with the vacation home. And make sure you read your trust document or have it sufficiently explained to you. Related to this, don't make the mistake of not reviewing your trust annually. The family situation changes. People, assets, the law, and your goals may change. That means that your trust might need to change also. Trust can be an important part of an estate plan, but do your best to avoid the common mistakes. This has been the Agricultural Law and Tax Report. I'm Roger McCohen. Get quality you can stand on. Hoofgrip is the proprietary formula that provides shock absorption for your animals with no ice buildup, slipping, cracking, or sogginess, making it the safest, most comfortable, and maintenance-free flooring on the market. Hoofgrip installs quickly and easily over existing surfaces, is easy to clean, and withstands extreme heat or cold. From vet offices to barns, wash racks to trailers and more, visit hoofgrip.com to find a dealer in your area today. We're here for the hardworking, the resilient. We're for the people who measure their days by what needs to get done, not by hours. Where kids learn responsibility at a young age and generations work side by side. Where work doesn't pause for holidays or bad weather. It just gets harder. Where value and hard work means more than the clothes you wear. We're Kleinschmidt's Western Store, Higginsville, Missouri. Routine dental examination and treatments are essential for high quality horse care. To prevent potential problems, a horse's mouth should be examined at least once a year. I'm Dr. Chris Blevins, equine field service veterinarian at Kansas State University Veterinary Health Center. We can examine the mouth and provide a treatment plan to meet the needs of each client and their horse. Visit us at ksvhc.org, the Veterinary Health Center, to discover, to teach, to heal. And welcome back to Better Horses Radio. So glad you joined us and thank you for staying with us. I got to tell you, this is going to be one of my important segments that we're going to have all about diversity. But this segment is brought to you by Klein Smith's Western Wear. 
Now, you've heard about us talking about this all the time, but I got to tell you, if you're looking for a Western store that can really gear you up, this is going to be one of them. Ever since 1969, they've been located in Higginsville, Missouri. And I got to tell you, they have all the incredible inventory that you need just to get everything done on your Western outfit. Now, Matt, I know you've shopped there once or twice and dropped a couple grand out there. Absolutely. I buy a lot of my boots there and uh, great selection, like 19,000 or 20,000 pair and uh, buy a lot of shirts there. It's a pretty awesome family owned store. So if you're not located in Missouri, I want you to check them out at kleinboot.com. That's K-L-E-I-N boot.com. Okay, so getting into this next segment that I'm very excited about, I want to introduce somebody who's coming to us from a different discipline, and this is going to be introducing Alexis Losey, and she's going to be located at Crown One Farms in Pleasant Hill, Missouri, and she's been training for a very long time, and she's also just received, uh, competed, and showed in the pre-St. George. I'd like to welcome to Better Horses, Alexis Losey. Alexis, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. So I want to make sure our listening audience, so that we're all on the same page, and I never want to assume anything. So the FEI, the International Equestrian Sports uh, uh, Group, I should say, actually has is a governing body of the equestrian sport. So the fundamentals of dressage is to develop the natural athletic ability and the willingness to perform. But you've been doing this for an awful long time. Can you walk us through the levels? When I say pre-St. George, what does that mean? Okay, so pre-St. George is an upper level in dressage. So if we're starting at the very bottom of dressage, we've got training level. That's where your baby horses and your, your people who are just starting out, it's a very basic walk, trot, canter test. And then as you work your way up the levels, first level, second level, third level, fourth level, those keep increasing in difficulty. So they start adding in um, half passes. They start adding in shoulder in. And as you work your way up to say fourth level, now we have canter half passes. We have medium trots. We have extended trots. We have shoulder in. We have a little bit of a pirouette. Uh, start our flying changes. And that's where um, then we hop into pre-St. George. And that's where the uh, FEI classes start, your, your international level. So you have your F, um, pre-St. George, and then the next level is intermediate. And then the Olympic level is Grand Prix. And so those are the really difficult classes. So does that make sense? Yes. As a matter of fact, that's, that's fascinating because these, these tests have, a, well, in the pre-St. George, you have a lot of pirouettes and a, a, a greater degree, I'm assuming, of collection and control on all this. But you actually brought in a four-year-old in the pre-St. George. And that, to me, was more fascinating than anything else. I don't think we put enough uh, confidence in our writing to knowing a four-year-old can get to that level. Walk us through on your challenges you faced with this horse. So no, he was not four. I started him as a four-year-old, but no, now he's currently 10 years old because it takes oh, there you go. Okay. that long yeah, to get a horse up to the FEI level. So, you know, your horse, if you think about it as a four-year-old, that's when we start our warm blood and we don't show them until, until a typically four-year-old. And so if we do a level a year, roughly, um, on these horses, then it takes them till, you know, maybe they're eight or nine before they're doing pre-St. George. My horse, he um, he's a little bit trickier, and so it took him a little bit longer. And so he decided 10 was his special coming out year. Um, and so you can have horses that it takes that long because there's so many, so much that you have to teach them. They have to develop those muscles. They have to develop the sitting power, the pushing power, the balance, the straightness. Uh, the unity with the rider. And so that just takes years and years of going up those levels to get to the pre-St. George level. You know, there's kind of a method to the madness here. You said it takes years to get up there. When you go to level one and go to the amount of tests are in level one to level two, there's a method to the madness of how to train these horses where everyone, no matter what discipline, needs that fundamentals. Is that something that's kind of lost when they're looking at dressage and I see you out there and they go, oh, that looks pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> but you know this too, because you're, you're doing Western dressage, but, and so there's not a much of a difference. So 
if I'm starting out at a training level, my horse, um, you know, he's doing the basic walk, trot, canter. The horse is balanced, you know, as a baby, doing very baby basics. But then as he goes up to say first level or second level, we're slowly increasing the difficulty and of, <clears throat> of the movements or of the balance of the collection of the power. And so <clears throat> you can't just hop from first level and then expect your horse to, you know, the next week or even the next year to hop up five levels to pre-St. George because they don't have the, the strength, the confidence, the understanding. So that's why the levels are created um, to slowly in, uh, introduce your horse to the next most difficult movement. So it's just a nice progression for the horse and the rider. Okay, now we're going to teach my horse this. Okay, and that builds upon this, and then that builds upon this. And so your horse isn't um, stressed out by slowly going up the level. We talked about this at the beginning of the show. I wanted to reiterate it. Uh, Matt Job and I were talking about the fundamentals, and the jargon is the same. But Matt, this is something you and I talked about, and I don't know if you've ever tried the English equestrian side of it, but the fundamentals of Western dressage, as Alexis Losey just mentioned, is pretty much everything that I rode with you both, and you both are working the same fundamentals. Absolutely. What I think is really cool about dressage is the body control and the body movement. Every time she touches her horse, it's, it moves, and it moves exactly how she asks it to. And to me, even though I'm not very well versed in dressage, the body movement matters a great deal when we're roping calves out in the pasture. It, it matters a great deal when we're running as fast as we can at mock chicken speeds shooting balloons. <laughs> I need to know that my horse is going to move when I ask him to move. You know, Alexis Losey, you dabbled in Western dressage and English. Can you kind of bridge that gap for our listeners? Yeah, you know, there's actually not that much difference between the two um, disciplines. One uses obviously Western gear, the other uses the English gear, but the fundamentals between the two are still the same. Yeah, the horses are different. You need your warm blood, typically for, for the English dressage. But for your Western dressage, any, any horse, all your stock breeds, your Arabians, uh, your Morgan, Saddlebreds, whatever horse you choose to ride can also do western dressage and so there's this big movement of you know all these different breeds coming to do western dressage which is really fun um but we still use the same principles we don't we want uh, the horse you know to move into a connection to have balance to have rhythm uh not be running away with the rider um they have to have a nice jog and a nice lope that are um balanced cadenced uh, it looks lovely to ride. The judge wants to sit on your horse. So there's a lot of control in Western dressage, just the same as you want your horses balanced and rhythmical in English dressage. It's just different breeds doing the same thing. Um, I, I really enjoy the crossover and working with different breeds for the Western dressage. It's been a lot of fun. We should probably point out here that the Western dressage has different patterns than the English and Alexis, you comment on that. Is the patterns that different? Do they make uh, a different amount of uh, disciplines in each testing? Yeah, the patterns are different. Um, so again, Western dressage is geared more towards your stock breeds, quarter horses, paints, uh, et cetera. Um, and those horses move differently than your big warm bloods with a bigger, um, more expressive gait. So they've, they've tailored the Western dressage test to appeal more to the, the stock breeds. Um, the movements, the circles, the patterns are just a little bit different. Um, the circles might be a little smaller sooner in the levels. Um, there's more turns left and right. So they're, keep, they're allowing the horses to do more in the Western dressage patterns. Whereas in the English dressage, there might be more time between the movements because the horses have bigger gaits. They need a little bit bigger turning radius uh, in, the, in the lower levels. And so that's been a little different or just interesting to note. Um, and so if you have a larger horse, um, such as, as your big 16 two-hand quarter horse, he has a bigger gait than, say, you know, your little 15-hand quarter horses with a smaller gait. So 
it actually might be more difficult at times for the larger horses with larger gait to do some of the, the patterns in the Western dressage because, oh, they have to turn quicker. Oh, they have to do this faster. So they really have to be balanced, really more sitting on their, their haunches. And it's, it's been, you know, it can be trickier. So what I really like is the idea of Matt Job and Alexis Losey talking. Matt, I have kid around with Alexis about throwing a rope off some of these warm bloods that are sitting in the English side. And, uh, and I've actually kid around with, you know, Matt Job coming over there and doing a pattern class in the Western dressage side. Uh, but I will say both of you, Matt, I'll let you weigh in first. Very important to have a horse that does the fundamentals and also important, Alexis, where you have a horse that is not going to get scared or spooked over every little thing that's going to, that's not correct in its path. Matt, you go first. Uh, yes to all that. And like I said, the fascination to me about dressage is the amount of control they have. And uh, I just love watching each and every movement. And uh, that does transfer. I think it does. You can tell me what you think, but I think it transfers into anything you do. I could sure see that that would be a good foundation on the horse. I like the idea. I'm not suggesting Alexis Losey start shooting guns off her warm bloods. That's not what I'm suggesting. But I am suggesting that there there might be a case, uh, Alexis, where there is room for obstacles in a in a dressage just to calm a horse down at the beginning stages of the fundamentals. Agreed or disagree? Oh, yeah, very much agreed. Um, most of my horses, when we start out, you know, you want to take them trail riding. You want to show them all the stuff. You want to get them out of your, your arena. We also do like to do a lot of desensitizing tarps and flags and umbrellas and you know, what have you, so that they're not as spooky. Yeah, as dressage people, we don't maybe go out as much out in the real world uh, to show our horses stuff. But then you'll have a lot of people who are, they like, they want to go trail riding, they want to go do, you know, uh, maybe let's show our horses some cows. So if we don't, I don't have the option of, you know, running into many cows, so my horses aren't as educated on cows, the horse that I'm looking at right now in the pasture, he would freak out and take off the other way, you know, so I don't have the opportunity as, you know, our Western friends, hey, we've got cows in the backyard, let's, and the horses are totally fine with the cows. So I'm a little jealous at times that I can't desensitize my horse maybe as easily as some of my Western friends, but no, you got to desensitize your horse. It, it really helps in the long run. So coming soon on Better Horses TV, Alexis Losey will be riding with Matt Joe with her warm blood in front of cattle. So this will be an entertaining event. Um, and everybody, first of all, I want to thank you. Uh, we got to wrap it up here, but I want to thank you, Alexis Losey, for joining us. Uh, again, this has been very educational, and I love to mix the disciplines up, and I think that's really a lot of fun. So professional dressage instructor and trainer, Alexis Losey with Crown One Farms over there in Pleasant Hill, Missouri. Alexis, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Okay, Matt, we're going to take a break. We're going to be right back with more of Better Horses Radio. I want you to stay with us. I'm Ed Adams. And I'm Matt Job. And we'll be right back right after these messages. And welcome back to Better Horses. You know, conducting the most variety of talent on this show, I am just pleased with all the professional horsemanship that we have. And Matt, again, I got to say, thank you for joining me on this show. I appreciate it. You bet. Happy to be here. And yes, it's great to hear from so many different aspects of our industry. You know, and I think this show is going to be, and I keep saying it, and I, I apologize this to my listeners, but I'm very excited about this one. You know, for more than a decade, Kurt Pate has conducted demonstrations and clinics. Matt, you and I talked about it, stockmanship and colt starting and horsemanship. And, and what I like about Kurt, he also pushes the safety side of it. But I tell you what, his abilities in conducting, conducting horsemanship and stockmanship is really his ability to be an effective communicator. And that's why I think this guy is sought after all over the world all over the nation international scenes things like that everyone i want you to welcome kurt pate kurt welcome to better horses uh thank you it's really good to get back on with you guys you know it's been i thank you for joining us now i know you're in missouri uh and you're conducting a few uh stockmanship type events and you know let's talk about the principles in which you you really get set i mean you got a mindset and you got a focus that you like to highlight on 
and uh, not only with horsemanship, but also with a lot of cattle. So kind of talk to me about how you get started when you kind of approach a, a, a clinic or any type of training programs that you like to put people through. Yeah, so I really don't like trouble. And I don't like <laughs> animals to be in trouble and horses to be in trouble or, or kids to be in trouble. And so, so really my whole kind of goal in life and life changes as we go through life but I really want to do things in a way where everybody's safe and the horses aren't troubled and the people aren't troubled. And the only way to do that is really, really concentrate on where the animal's mind is as far as fear and not being afraid and the rider as well. So that's where we start out with. And uh, so, you know, everything's about pressure. And so pressure, when it gets to be too much, it's a real, real bad thing. But also when it gets to be too little, it'd be kind of a bad thing. So, so that's kind of what I try to do is figure out how to get people to understand how to pressure an animal that they don't create fear, but a response and then reward them for it. I love how you mix the same amount of due diligence in safety and don't like trouble, not only with the horses, but also with the cattle. I've watched you out there. Uh, you have about as much sympathy and and concern of the cattle as you do the horses which i think that separates you from everybody else and i think that's how you approach those cattle is really great and i think the that's growing more and more talk to me how you like to focus in on that and talk about the economic benefits of handling stock correctly yeah so i i think every most people really want to work their cattle uh you know kind of properly and right but we've all kind of been brought up where maybe we use some of the wrong pressures. So I've learned from some real nice people and some great people that are really effective at it. So I'm just trying to pass that on. And when most people see that you can approach an animal, kind of like the horsemanship deal, you know, maybe 60 years ago, we didn't do everything perfect. Maybe 50 years ago, we didn't do anything perfect. But boy, today we're sure a lot closer to not perfect, but we're a lot better. And so with the stockmanship, I think it's the same thing. We're all learning how to work our animals better, use better facilities, and understand, you know, in the in the beef business, there's a lot more profit when animals are, uh, gentle animals get fat and, and get bred. And so, so when we have gentle animals that are getting fat and bred, then that, that gives us a chance for more profit. But I think a hot, lot better quality of life for the human, the animals, and everybody else involved. You know, Kurt, I think sometimes uh, we get really busy and, you know, you got town jobs, you got this, you got kid ball games and you get in a hurry. And sometimes, you know, cattle need this, cattle need this. So I feel like sometimes we got in a rush and we got rammy jammy with the four wheelers and everything else. But I kind of feel like there's a trend coming back to your your stockmanship like you're teaching. Do you do you feel that trend coming back around? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think we're so much better right now than when I was growing up. I mean, there, there's always been really, really good horsemen. There's always been really, really good stockmen. And what I think we're doing is, is we're increasing the number of good ones and decreasing the number of bad ones. Where for a while, it was just maybe more bad ones than good ones. But that's our job as horsemen, people that teach horsemanship and stockmanship, is we're trying to change those numbers so we have way more good stockmen than bad stockmen and horsemen. Do you have a, a, a key point? Like, where would you start? And, you know, if you don't have Kurt paid at your house to help you out, what is one key point you can do to start being a better stockman? Yeah, stop yelling and yeah. use your pressure to get animals to move rather than noise or something else. Maybe your presence, just like a horse. I mean, we all know where to put our leg on a horse. or We're learning where to put our leg on a horse and how to release the pressure. And so... That, that'd that be the thing that I'd do and, and stop yelling and slow down and try to get the animals to think their way out of pressure rather than force them into pressure. Good stuff. Yes, sir. We want you in clinics and roping and introducing the horse to the roping side of it. Uh, you have to use a lot of patience. Talk to us. How? What's your first approach when you're, and I don't want to get into cold starting here, but what's your first approach when you got a green horse that is going into the cattle for the very first time and you're going to throw that rope off them? What's the first thing that you have to know the fundamentals before you feel confident in doing that? Yeah, you need to be able to ride it with one hand for one thing. And that's, that's, uh, that's really changed the way I ride colts. You know, everybody rides colts so two handed. And then when you do try to rope on them, you can't, you can't keep them pointed towards the cow. 
And so if you can't keep your horse pointed towards the cow when you're trying to rope one, you're going to get in a wreck because they're going to leave and then you won't be able to get your dallies or it'll pull your saddle off or something like that. So, so I need to be able to ride my horse with one hand and swing my rope and, and all those things. And, and, uh, you know, if the horse is afraid of an animal, <laughs> this, this is, this is not for everybody, but if you know how to handle a horse and handle a rope, if I have a horse that's afraid of cows, sometimes I'll just rope a cow and dally up where they can't get away from them. They got to get over their fear. But that's kind of advanced stuff. So I, I think a lot of folks, if you don't have those skills, get a breakaway Honda. So if you rope something and things go kind of not how you want, it'll just come off your come off in your hand and you'll be good. Or I say to folks, never be afraid to drop your rope, especially in a corral. You can always pick up your rope in a corral. Outside sometimes a little tougher, but uh, not nothing nothing we do in horsemanship or stockmanship is worth somebody getting hurt or afraid. Kurt, everybody's been wondering where you're spending most of your time. I know you're up there in Wyoming and you're traveling quite a bit. Are you pulling off a lot of clinics or what seems to be taking the biggest part of your time? Yeah, I'm in Montana and uh, my, my life has made a big change. My wife passed away in December and uh, we have the art of the cowgirl. My daughter is managing it. We've sold it and uh, she's still managing it. My daughter, Mesa. And so, but I've been doing a lot of stockmanship things and, uh, doing a little bit more horsemanship stuff. So I've been, uh, I've been just getting readjusted to life and uh, enjoying it and uh, getting back to the roots of horsemanship and stockmanship. So I, I have a lot of stuff I do with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association on the stockmanship side. And then, uh, of course, I'm with Perina and do some things for them, horsemanship side. So it's, it's real. I'm, I can really balance things out nice. We have listeners that are dialing in or, or emailing in, talk about your breeding. Are you doing any breeding programs or are you training any horses for sale? Are you getting into that side of the fence? No, I don't. I haven't uh, haven't bought a horse for uh, a lot of years and I haven't sold a horse for a lot of years. I get everybody's troubled horses and then I, I give them to somebody else. So <laughs> I, I, I don't uh, I don't have either one of those. But I, I uh, my daughter has some colts or some mares and she's I help her start some colts. But we don't have any horses for sale. I'm, you know, but I am here at uh, Ride Prosperity Ministries, and we just halter broke a bunch of really, really nice colts, and they're having a sale again this fall, and I'll be there to help that. So that's where I'd recommend to go find some colts that are really gentle and really handy. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm going to invite you to stay at our place. You're more than welcome to stay here in Missouri when you're coming down, and that's great. I also want to say uh, you've got to be proud of Tammy Pate and the legacy she put through on Art of the Cowgirl. And we are going to cover that here at Better Horses, but it is just a great scene to know that that's going to continue on. You're right. And uh, I am so proud of her and uh, I can't believe what she did and uh, how she did it with, with, uh, I mean, no money. We just, she, she, uh, she was incredible, but what I didn't see, and I told her it wasn't going to work and she said it will. <laughs> and I didn't see what, saw as far as what people want in the horse fair world these days and women are such a big part of it and uh and she has showcased how great of stockmen and horsemen and cowgirls and showmen that the women are and and, uh, and you know of course the foundation is all about bringing on the saddle makers and the boot makers and all those things so she's done a she's done something that uh i don't think she'll ever be forgotten you know, uh, ditto on that, too. Everyone we're talking to, if you just joined us, Kurt Pate, professional horse trainer, he brings a lot of value to the equine industry, but also to the livestock industry, too, guys. So I also want to let you know he spends a lot of time in stockmanship and demonstrations and trainings. And Kurt, if they wanted to get a hold of you, what's the best way to contact you or where do you want to direct them as far as a website or Facebook page? Yeah, I've got to wait. I don't I have a website. I think I have a website. Uh, a Facebook page too, but I've never been on Facebook, so I never answer anything on it. But uh, it's Kurt Pate Stockmanship. Kurt Pate Stockmanship at Rygate, Montana. I said Wyoming. I don't know why I said Wyoming, but you're in Montana. So, Kurt, we want to I thank like you Wyoming. for joining us. <laughs> and above all, we got to have you back. We really appreciate this, and we wish you all the luck, and thank you for everything you're doing in the equine industry. You bet. Thank you, guys. You guys are making big moves here. Keep it up. Well, we appreciate you. Professional horse trainer, Kurt Pate and uh, Merle, or Merle. And this is, you know, Matt, this is why I changed co-host because I called you Merle instead of Matt. <laughs> hey, Matt, we got more better horses coming our way. I'm Ed Adams. And I'm Matt Job. 
and we'll be right back right after these sponsors. Hi, I'm Dr. Dylan Luter, a specialist in equine performance medicine at the Kansas State University Veterinary Health Center. Our new service focuses on lameness diagnosis, advanced imaging, physical therapy, and regenerative medicine for horses with injuries preventing them from performing at their best. We can treat a variety of conditions and design a customized rehabilitation plan to meet the needs of each client and their horse. Visit us at ksvhc.org, the Veterinary Health Center, to discover, to teach, to heal. Hi, I'm Tommy with Heritage Tractor. Whether you're looking to maintain your yard or your whole ranching operation, Heritage Tractor has John Deere mower and tractor packages that make work fly by. With a variety of horsepower and attachment configurations, we have a package to best fit your needs and budget. To learn more about these exclusive packages, visit us in store or online at heritagetractor.com. Legendary products, extraordinary service, that's our heritage. Established in 1956, the Pinto Horse Association of America was formed to welcome all types of equines and maintain their show records and pedigrees. PTHA currently has over 88,000 members with 157,000 registered Pintos. There are currently three separate registries, the color registry, the solid registry, and the long ear registry. We welcome all levels of competition within a family-friendly environment. Become a member, register, and add value to your horse. For more information, check out the website, Pinto World. Com. Get quality you can stand on. Hoof Grip is the proprietary formula that provides shock absorption for your animals with no ice buildup, slipping, cracking, or sogginess, making it the safest, most comfortable, and maintenance-free flooring on the market. Hoof Grip installs quickly and easily over existing surfaces, is easy to clean, and withstands extreme heat or cold. From vet offices to barns, wash racks to trailers and more. Visit hoofgrip.com to find a dealer in your area today. We're here for the hardworking, the resilient. We're for the people who measure their days by what needs to get done, not by hours. Where kids learn responsibility at a young age and generations work side by side. Where work doesn't pause for holidays or bad weather. It just gets harder where value and hard work means more than the clothes you wear. We're Kleinschmidt's Western Store, Higginsville, Missouri. It's time to go with United Mosquito and Fly Control's premier fly system for fly control in your barn. Providing relief for horses from the stress of fighting flies. and also makes a barn more pleasant for everyone in the barn. Easy, effective, and safe. With United Mosquito and Fly Control, we provide a full service. You as the barn owner don't have to do anything. We go everywhere and take care of everything with our friendly, fast service. Call today at 913-558-3814 or email paul at unitedmosquito.com. And welcome back to Better Horses Radio. We appreciate you staying with us as we explore a lot of great ideas about training in the equine industry. And I want to tell you this next segment is brought to you by the John Deere dealer of the Midwest. It's called Heritage Tractor. And if you haven't heard from these guys, they're going to be able to put together any implementations or mowers or anything that you have in relation to John Deere tractors. Located in Kansas, Missouri, and Arkansas, shop now if you want to complete all your farm and construction needs or even lawn and garden, go over to Heritage Tractor. In the meantime, that's heritagetractor.com. Okay, not only is he operating as my co-host for this day, I'm putting him to work, and he's also going to be part of my next guest. Everyone, I tell you, Matt Joe, he owns and operates uh, Seabar J Ranch in Windsor, Missouri, with his wife, Angie, and his youngest son, Anthony, following in his dad's footsteps. You know, Matt's been a native veteran in the U.S. Air Force, and he served in this country five overseas tours, and he's earned a number of awards and medals, and that's all great. But I'll tell you what's really kind of fascinating me about this guy is Matt's completed successfully in the sport of cowboy-mounted shooting, and he's also competed in extreme cowboy racing. Now, this guy has earned several world, national, regional, and state titles, in the last few years, including the 2018 Professional Armed Forces Radio Rodeo World Finals and also the National Championship of Mounted Shooting in 2017. So he's got National Final Reserve Champion, World Champion, and Mid-Central Champions all at the EXCA and the AHCA. Everyone, welcome. Matt Joe. Matt, thanks again for staying with us. Howdy, Perks. Great to be here. 
you know, that was probably the longest intro I've done for anybody. So I want you to appreciate what yeah. I just did. But, you know, yeah, that was kind of windy. I'm glad everybody stayed with me on that. But I wanted everybody to know that you also, you know, you're doing boarding and you're doing training and you're giving lessons and you're doing a lot of, you're teaching a lot of clinics. And I think that's really, really important. But we just got out of this show and we talked about dressage. We talked about Kurt Pate being in the stockmanship. You're seeing all of this. You're kind of one guy that's developing all of every, every discipline and everything we talk about in jargon as far as training horses. I love to watch you pull this all together into one specific item in which you're doing it all and i'm talking mounted shooting extreme cowboy racing it all relates correct yes absolutely like we just got back from memphis we had a national final shooting out there and uh we did pretty good out there but a big thing is body control on your horse you know and, and having that horse in a willing frame of mind and you know like alexis and their dressage that's they have extreme body control kurt he's always talking about body control and getting your horse set up right and not having that fear and not not being bothered and uh, all that relates to the mounted shooting and then you know our Flint Hills ranching adventures we're always out there roping cattle working cattle we have to have a willing horse that's fully in control and uh, both of the, our guests talk about the same thing they just say it different you know let's unpack this a little bit because you know what you're doing with all of your clinics is to make sure that the owner doesn't screw up the horse and train it wrong. When you introduce mounted shooting to a group of horses and riders that have never done it before, what's the first thing that's going through your head as far as safety, but also introducing that to a horse? Yeah, so absolutely. So at our beginner shooting clinic, I tell people that uh, we're not focused on guns or shooting. That's just a really cool side effect that's going to happen later in the day. And uh, so the first part is we have to assess the people and the horses, find out what level they're at and what they need. And so we focus on the horse's needs the first four or five hours. And uh, we want to get that horse in a willing frame of mind. We want to have that horse not bothered. We want to work on desensitization. We want to work on the rider and the horse having better communication skills. And uh, when a horse is telling us no, that's when we get bucked off. That's when we get hurt. But when we get that horse saying, yes, ma'am, or yes, sir, that's when they're a safe horse. And that's when we go and have a lot of fun. The one thing I, I enjoyed about your class is when you're introducing horses to mounted shooting, the first thing you tell them in that afternoon, as you just said, you don't introduce it until later in the afternoon if you warm them up, is everyone take their bridles off, put on your halters, and we're going to shoot off halters. Explain why you do that after the riders go into their initial shock. What are we doing? And explain why you do that. Yeah. So my theory is a lot of times we are in the horse's way and that transfers to many aspects. Doesn't matter what we're doing, but we're in their way. And a lot of times we jump at a loud noise or we do that and we yank on our horse. And I don't feel like it's fair to have a big bridle on a horse and then yank their face off. And so after we get our horses in that willing frame of mind, that yes, sir, yes, ma'am frame of mind, then a lot of times we'll just ride around a little bit in halters and lead ropes. And uh, when that's going good, then I like to introduce the gunfire with halter and lead ropes because our we're not yanking on their face. We're being as fair and as honest as we can to the horse. Well put. Now, translate that. I think that's the most important thing because if you're out there by yourself, and you want to introduce a gun to a horse, there's a process here that you have to do. And I don't know if you agree or not, but we've, have you ever seen people actually ruin horses by doing it wrong? Absolutely. You know, you can just go grab a horse and run off shooting and they may take it and they may not, <laughs> you know? And so you, you might have a 50, 50 chance. I like to stack my odds in my favor and, and in my customer's favors. So we, we spend a lot of time, prepping that horse, letting them get in that willing frame of mind, letting them get that desire to please, letting them not be afraid and uh, overcome any issues they have so that we can raise that 50-50 chance to maybe 90-10 chance, you know, and uh, stack those odds in our favor, introduce it in a nice, calm manner where the horse is happy and we put their, their needs and their feelings first. And that's just one portion of what EXCA does. I know you're mid-central champion and you're also Kansas State champion of the EXCA and uh, Missouri State champion. So disciplines, again, 
the EXCA and the UHCA and all of that is bringing a lot of obstacles and a lot of challenges to a horse that they normally don't see every day. Yes, absolutely. So when you're doing some of the obstacle competitions, the cowboy races, you don't know what's going to be out there. You know, there may be bridges, maybe water crossings, maybe, you know, crazy whipper man or, you know, any sort of thing. And it goes back to having that horse in a willing frame of mind. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. So when you put your legs on and you ask for something, they they think for a split second, they think, has this person lied to me in the past? You know, or has this person been pretty honest about everything we've done? You know, they've they've taken care of me. So, OK, I'm going to trust them and I'm going to go. And that's that's what we need to get them in. And let's bring that over to you doing something that's really incredible. And I think we really be a disservice if we didn't talk about this in the next portion of this segment is let's talk about the Flint Hills. For those who are not familiar with it, located out there in the Kansas area, it's a thousand acres of virgin tall grass that everybody can go out to. And you put a special program for people who can't experience the Western way of life. This is something they can grab onto. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. So my partner, Rex Bookman, and myself and our wives, we own uh, Flint Hills Ranching Adventures. We're on Facebook and our website should be published here pretty soon. But we get cattle in all the time from, from different states, different regions, and we graze them from spring to fall. And uh, what we do is we take customers out in the spring and we help them. They, let, they go with us and we drive the cattle out to their spring pasture, summer pasture. Then it reverse that come fall, we gather up all the cattle, drive them to the yards so that we can ship them out in trucks. And we do brandings also. And then we also have one top hand competition. But during our Flint Hills Ranch and Adventures, we focus a lot on history and education and then also just having fun using our horses and having a good time together. Matt, can we get specific about another event you're having? Is I, I don't know if it's an invitational, but you have a Cowboy Challenge coming out in the Flint Hills, too. Can you tell us about that one? Yes. Yeah, so uh, mid-September, we have the Top Hand Challenge. And that is, we still have a couple openings. We're still taking applications for that. And that's where we'll take a dozen cowboys, cowgirls, and we will put them kind of through the ringer for two and a half days. They'll have to gather cattle. They'll have to sort cattle. We'll weigh cattle, we'll rope cattle, do all the things we do every day on a ranch, but they'll be doing it horseback and they will be doing a uh, ranch obstacle course. And of course, you'll have to shoot a gun because I'm involved. <laughs> and uh, and at the end of that competition, uh, you can watch it on Better Horses TV, but you'll also, uh, we have a lot of awesome sponsors. There'll be prizes, gifts, uh, top hand belt buckle, $1,000 in cash. It's a really, really cool deal. So as you said, they're going through just really just being a top hand out there in the Flint Hills at the ranch over there at uh, your place. And they're just going to be running cattle and sorting cattle and doing everything on the obstacle works that normal guys do every day. Yes, sir. We just put a uh, put a challenge to it and uh, put a timer and a judge on it. And and uh, but we do we do educate them on how we do things at the ranch. And uh, we're at my partner Rick's Bookman's ranch, the Bar U Ranch. And we educate them on this is how we do it and uh, judge them accordingly. Okay, Matt, if they're interested in this or any of your clinics that you got coming out, I know you've got a website. It's cbarj.com. You're big on Facebook. They can see you there too. Anywhere else that they can get a hold of you? No, that's the best place is uh, either Matthew L. Job on Facebook, um, Flint Hills Ranch and Adventures on Facebook, or dial me up 660 537 nine five four two and if you're just tuning in we're talking to matt job over there at cbar j ranch in windsor missouri and he's been a delight to talk to and matt i gotta tell you i can't tell you how much i appreciate you being my co-host this time you had a lot of fun you bet been a great day and learned from some good folks you know this has been a great show i can't tell you we've got it we quarterback this one pretty nicely so i think we did really good hey if you listen to our radio show we do appreciate you but if you do miss it you can check us out on our podcast by just checking out better horses and we also have a map coming out our summer edition of our newspaper with some great tips and hey i gotta tell everybody uh we've got your wife coming in with an article really good article really proud of that one so you can hear us on the you can see our newspaper this summer but also check us out at better horses tv on rfd the cowboy channel and also streaming equus tv 
So, and Matt, that's it. We're going to wrap this up uh, again. I'm delighted. I'm keyed up. I'm motivated. I'm going to go to your clinics and uh, I'm just really proud to be a part of this. So special thanks to our radio producer, Brianna Johnson, and our TV producer, Kelly Creech, who naturally, we also like to thank our sponsors. Well, that wraps it up for this week. We want you all to be good buckaroos and buckarettes. Mind your mom and dads out there. Be brave, but don't take any chances. Until next time, I'm Ed Adams. And I'm Matt Job. Happy trails and always ride for the brand. Mm-hmm.